All right, my meatheads, particularly my nerd meatheads, this one is for you. If you are not feeling like nerding out on something, just keep going because we're going down the nerd rabbit hole. Um, so we're going to discuss, I would say it's a hot topic, but that would definitely be improper use of the word hot, of scapular moral rhythm. Um, I'm going to dig through what the hell is that, where did that term come from, and why is that kind of a topic that I get a lot now? So again, I can honestly say this isn't one of those things where I'm like, I get a lot of questions about my beard or my haircut. Like I'm just making shit up. I want to talk about my beard or my haircut. I get questions on this one all the time. Um, and I got a question about it this morning. So again, if you guys have been following my last few videos, one of the themes I've been doing now for content is on my app in the forums. People can ask questions. And based off those questions, I'll do a video for everybody just because it's better than me just thinking of random shit. Um, it's me actually answering a question that someone that's arguably more normal than I am, for sure more normal than I am with dealing with muscles, um, and answering it. So hopefully it'll help somebody else. So I answered this question. <laughs> it was an audio reply. I think I gave the, my member nine minutes. So it's a long ass one. It's probably going to be longer than that because I got pictures now. Um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about scapular humor rhythm um, and this notion of the way you know your body should move. Um, and so I want to put a big disclaimer on all of this. One, first off, I don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, meaning that somehow this has kind of turned into a teamy thing. I don't give a shit. The goal of this video is to really try and pre present this complete picture of this understanding of this principle. And if you trust the internet, this principle, this name has been around for like 100 years. I mean, this is shit that I heard on and off, you know, through college, through actually, it's in my textbooks I've had shit on it. You're going to hear it all in like the PT world. Every therapist is familiar with the scapular more of the rhythm. This drawing's fucking everywhere. You can find this drawing. 8 million, the same thing on Google some places. So it's been around for a bit. Um, it's been in and out of the physical therapy world. It's been in and out of the functional realm of people. And rightfully so, the bodybuilding community is actually starting to be a little bit more aware of our bodies and how maybe they should work or they should function. Um, and so again, just want to take this information, so kind of dissect it a little bit. And one of the most important things, if you're going to try and look at this thing, this is just a name, so this is a thing. And then within this name of this thing, there's this idea there's a principle underneath that. And so what's very important if you're going to make decisions based off of principles, you want to see if it's consistently ap applicable throughout the entire body. Um, and again, depending on who or where you're hearing it from, my only issue with this sometimes is I get people coming to me with this question kind of out of fear. Like they're out of fear they're going to break their body because they've heard this thing. And some people want to present it a little bit more as like a hard rule. I, if you're watching for a hard rule or for me to tell you exactly what to do or exactly what not to do, this is not the video. Again, I want to present you a bunch of information. I want you to use your brain and I want you to make the best decisions that you can all on your own. <laughs> so that's a weird thing. So I'm not telling you to do anything that I say to do. I'm going to say, oh, here's why maybe some people say this. Oh, here's something for the other side of this. And you take what you want to do with that and again, kind of make your own decisions. So, um, and looking at this, and again, why is this important? The last little disclaimer of these freaking few minute long disclaimers, which is ridiculous. Why is this important? Well, this falls in the category, in my opinion, of, you know, not wanting to have this overuse injury type thing. You know, so if you've watched my stuff for a minute, you say, oh, this is right up your wheelhouse because I'm always about nerds and angles and protractors and everything's got to be just right. Um, and so what's the point of that? And so why would I have, if someone's doing a cable tricep extension, you know, I'm going to say, okay, line it up so that cable goes right through your elbow joint. You know, why do I say that? Why don't I just say, okay, well, is it going to, what if it comes out here? Is that bad? Or what if it comes out this direction? I do a tricep extension and the cable's pulling at a 45 degree angle, not lined up with my arm. Can I prove that that's going to break my elbows? No, I can't prove it at all. Can I prove that any of these things, any of these theor theories are going to be inherently bad? Can I uh, prove that this alignment is going to be inherently better? No, I can't prove shit um, because of the way that the human body works. So again, even if there is this notion of the way your body should move or the way it should ideally receive force, again, especially put through the crazy bodybuilding filter where there's nothing normal or functional about trying to put on as much muscle as you possibly can, and especially what we use, the amount of volume, the amount of repetitions, the amount of whatever. It's good to have these concepts of, okay, I'm going to do this much with this much weight, this many bajillion times over the next couple decades. I want things to be preserved. I want things to be healthy. I want things to function the way they should function. So really all this is, is we're taking some principles and we're making some educated guesses. That's all that it is. If anybody tells you anything other than it's an educated guess, they just want you to think some really good things about them. <laughs> it doesn't have a whole lot to do with you. So we're trying to make some educated guesses. So again, back to my tricep example, there's somebody, <clears throat> again, overuse stuff and might not show up for a couple months, a couple years, a couple decades. And again, this is coming from a lot of personal experience with myself and clients. 
I have firsthand done stuff that people told me, oh, maybe you shouldn't do it that way or try this way. And I said, oh, it doesn't hurt now. F off. I've been doing it this way for three or four years. Zero pain in my elbows. And I remember literally a good you know, coach or trainer, kind of a mentor I had at some point in time. He's like, well, just wait. And I was like, oh, I'll be fine. And then my elbows were effed and I had to change stuff. So anyway, <clears throat> there's this notion of trying to prevent overuse stuff because it might not present itself for, again, months, years, whatever. And then again, just the nature of the human body, the size of people's joints, the actual you know surface and stuff, the way they face, the directions, there's a lot of discrepancy from person to person. So some people can just have bulletproof joints in their body. And so they could technically do something that's not ideal or wrong and do it for 30 years and have zero issues and say, ah, see, that shit doesn't matter. And so again, you gotta think about all that. And you gotta think about that with this stuff as well too, is use this information just to make some educated guesses and to make some decent decisions. All right, that whole mess, if you stuck with me, good for you. You get a cookie. <clears throat> Scapping for more rhythm, what is this? If you trust the internet, this term was created about 100-ish years ago. Maybe. It's, it's been around for a minute. And all that it is, is that it sounds cool, right? Scapula humoral rhythm. So we've got the names of two bones in there. So we have the scapula, we have the humerus, and we have this rhythm. I mean, it's a great name. I'll give it. It's a 10 out of 10, 100 years ago. Some guy that invented this made a name. And what it really is, is the thing you have to realize is we're not actually looking at a single joint. We're not looking at joint uh, mechanics. People call this, well, we're going to do shoulder flexion. What happens when we do shoulder flexion? Well, in reality, the funny thing is we look at other joints, elbow flexion, extension. We're actually talking about a joint. Here we're talking about multiple joints. And the funny thing is of the four joints that really make up your shoulder, so you got the GH joint, the scapular humoral, or excuse me, the scapular thoracic joint, how your scapula goes over your thoracic rib cage. You've got the, uh, where your chromium meets your scapula. So your scapula doesn't actually truly float. It kind of moves, it, it, it's articulations that floats over the ribs, but it does attach you know, to a bone that attaches to something else. So you've got where your clavicle attaches to your um, scapula and the acromium, and then you've got where the clavicle attaches to the sternum. Um, so there's really four joints. And so we get to like be all very functional. Let's make sure these two joints are functioning. Don't worry about those other two. We're not gonna talk about either. I just think that's kind of funny. But anyway, rant. So we're looking at basically the rhythm of what we're gonna call shoulder flexion. It's not really shoulder flexion, in my opinion. It's not one joint. It's really, we're looking at two big joints. So what we're really looking at is a bone moving in space. If I move this bone, my humerus, from down here at my side, the shoulder flex overhead. This is what this is in case you can't see this horrible drawing that I just did quickly. This little turd looking thing here is supposed to be a scapula. This is your humerus. And so what happens is when you take your humerus from down here at your side and you raise it up straightish overhead, I couldn't even make it straight, you get the idea. When it travels through 180 degrees, where does that 180 degrees come from? And that's where we get this rhythm thing. So if you can see my little dots here, this is supposed to be the, where the scapula started and where it moved to. I don't know if these are right. So if I was really measuring like an angle in here, I'm going to draw over top of this now, just so you can see. Obviously, I drew the angle out here. But, you know, if you were doing like from an axis of rotation, you know, we did this type of thing, then this whole angle here. So this is 60 degrees, just so that makes sense before I ruin my drawing. So here's the scapula. And so what we say, if we move through 180 degrees, these seem to be the most agreed upon numbers. Obviously, there's going to have to be some variance to person to person. Maybe if there's enough variance, we call it dysfunction. I don't know. We'll talk about it. Um, but so if, when we're going through 180 degrees, the scapula kind of rotates 60 degrees. And so you can see this is the scapula moving 60 degrees. And then if we look at this joint, the GH joint, where the humor sits in the side of the scapula, this goes through about 120 degrees. And so that a whole 180 degrees range of motion comes from the rhythm of those two bones moving together. 60 plus 120 equals 180. So from my understanding, this started as an observation. Someone said, oh, when we do this, Here's what happens. And we made an observation about it. Um, and so what, the way that this was used from my understanding, especially because again, this is nobody was thinking about this in the bodybuilding world till now. So this is using the physical therapy world and things. I think it makes sense. It's mainly a screening tool. So if we say, oh, like in this, think about who this is really important for. I mean, it's important for bodybuilders. It's important for everybody with a body. But you think about a 70 year old trying to reach up and get stuff off their shelf. And like, this is what they, I mean, this, if you haven't worked with an older population, I mean, over 60, ah, this is common. So they would use this type of stuff to actually assess and say, well, what's the issue here? What's moving? What's not moving? Is Okay, the scapula doesn't move at all. That's why we stop at this really rough looking 120 degrees. Or maybe the scapula does move, but the joint is actually kind of frozen, you know, so the humerus doesn't move in there well. So it's basically just everything's kind of a shrug to move. So at some point in time, from my perception of this, is this turned from an observation into some sort of rule, <laughs> as far as this is how your body has to move. So again, I might be taking some of this wrong, but these are some of the main things I hear. 
It's this is how your body should move. This is proper function. So if you're going to move your arm, this is how it's supposed to move. And the thing that I always wonder about that, so again, I think I've completely uh, explained this. This is what scapular rhythm is. If you've never heard of it before, and now you know what it is. It's this observation of this. And then the thing I want people to think about is it's turned into a little bit of a rule. And I want you to take that rule. We're going to talk about it, talk about some situations. Again, is it here? Is it not here? Whatever. Um, and then try and apply it to everywhere in the body. Because again, if this is the proper function of how our body should move, then this isn't going to be some unique circumstance that just exists just with these neighboring two joints. From a functional standpoint, lots of motion comes from lots of joints. And so it seems then interesting to me that this one is one that we talk about a lot. And of course, there's some unique things at this joint. I'm going to talk about another joint later. And there are some unique things that occur at this joint compared to the other ones, but we'll come back to that. So this is now, this is how your body should proper, uh, properly function. And the question that I always thought when people say that, I was like, well, when? So anytime I move my humerus, the scapula has to move. So again, we already kind of established the scapula has 60 degrees, this range of motion in this shoulder flexion type thing. And the GH joint in this shoulder flexion type thing has 120 degrees. So if those are the amount of range of motion each individual joint has. Is it okay for me to move within those ranges? So if I just have my arm at my side, can I move my arm? Is this okay? Or is this improper function if I move my arm 10 degrees at the side with my scapula still? Is that okay? I don't know. I'm not trying to be an asshole. Maybe I am. But what happens if I move it 20 degrees, 30 degrees? Is that okay? Can I move that or is that dysfunction? So this is based off an observation. If I do this, this maybe qualifies as dysfunction. And I'm not, I'm not trying to provide the answer here because I don't really know. And so if, if that is true, if someone's saying, oh no, well you can move it 10 degrees, then I just wonder where you can draw the line. Where should you draw the line? And I'll give you some, I won't draw any lines, but I'll give you some framework maybe to think about to kind of hopefully answer some of those questions. So just think about that one, is that apparently sometimes it's implied that you can't move either joint in isolation. So again, if I'm, am I allowed to move my humerus at all? Or does the scapula have to move every single time my humerus moves at all? Is it just shoulder flexion-y? What about abduction, adduction type stuff? What about internal, external rotation? So is there something where that joint can't, art all it is is joint articulation. So is it the head's allowed to move, not allowed to move this way, or this way maybe, but this is okay. So again, can I do, is this motion allowed, internal, external rotation, or do I have to move my scapula when that moves as well too? So these are some things that I would like to think about. What about the inverse? If there's some magical relationship that occurs, that again, when people talk about function, there's this way your nervous system has to orchestrate it. Anything outside of this orchestration is just a crime against your body. What about my scapula? So if I can't move my GH joint, in isolation without moving my scapula, can I move my scapula in isolation without moving my GH joint, which would be like a shrug, which would be like a pure retraction, which would be like a depression. So again, if there's some relationship that exists between these two joints, the inverse is going to be true as well too, right? Where it's again, these neighboring joints can only move together. They can never move in isolation. Um, and then the argument is, as soon as this happens, does dysfunction create is dysfunction created so if you try and move this one in isolation you're going to create dysfunction and i i don't know what that means to be honest i don't know how someone would for sure say one again i i don't know where to clearly define what's proper function and i also don't know what to define as far as where what would actually create dysfunction what does create dysfunction mean does it mean that there's something again if the way you control things is in your brain so anytime you move any joint in your body anywhere dysfunction is created so again, as soon as I do a leg extension and move my knee in isolation, when I get off of that, do I forget how to walk? Because again, when you walk, your knee doesn't work in isolation. So if I go from isolation to a machine to walking, do I have dysfunction? Is my gait messed up now? I forget how to walk. I feel like I know how to walk after I get off a leg extension. So that's the next claim is not doing this creates dysfunction. Again, if I can't properly, I personally can't properly define function as far as where I'm going to draw lines of how those joints can move or can't move in isolation. Again, most people seem to think this is okay, but this is not okay, but this is okay, maybe 10 degrees, 30, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is for that one. And then there's this notion too that the joint jams. Um, and so again, if I, if I really try and take my joint through the whole range of motion, so if you just imagine this joint in isolation, obviously there's going to be a point where the, if there's 120 degrees at the ends of that on both ways, like most joints in the body, you're going to run out of room because the thing that's unique about this is you're going to run out of room normally in most joints in the body is kind of bone to bone type stuff. 
not actually bone ever really almost touches and that kind of stuff, except for when there's actually like joints are together like that to a certain degree. But you're going to run out of range somewhere and there's stuff in there. So there is this notion, obviously, of especially, you know, if you're looking how your humerus sits in the in the side of your scapula, you know, there is this acromion. This can't really see it from here. This is like not the best place to look at it, but looking at it to the side, you got this little hook over the top. That's horrible. But you got the acromion, which is part of your scapula, your humerus sits under. And amongst the other spaces, now you got a bunch of shit that runs through there. You know, you've got shoulder shit, you've got bicep shit, you've got nerve shit. And so there is this notion if you kind of, when you get to those ends, can you smash that stuff together and cause problems? Maybe. I mean, I think that's a reasonable thing to consider. So because of the nature of this joint, so again, as far as the nervous system and coordinating, pro coordinating proper function, I don't know if something exists just unique to the shoulder joint. I can't think of what proper functional motion is just for that, those two joints relative to each other. But there are some unique things about the joint, right? It's that golf ball on a tee. So if I'm going to talk about something, basically the pelvis and the femur and the pelvis, it's a completely different joint. I mean, that joint actually, the, the, the structure of it comes from structure. <laughs> it comes from bone, articulation of bone and just the, the, the nature of a true ball and socket joint. Where this is, again, that, that analogy somebody made is a golf ball sitting on a tee. So there's a lot more dependence on tissue to keep your GH joints together. So... Here's the things that basically are said that this is how this, for me, the, the strange jump that's been made is, you know, is that this is an observation and then it's turned into a rule. So this is how your body should function, proper function all the time. If you don't do that, you're going to mess up your body's function um, or you're going to, it's improper movement patterns or you're going to mess up proper patterns or patterns function. I don't know all those words. I, to me, the nervous system, I've heard it's going to mess up your nervous system. So again, functions and patterns and all that are controlled by your nervous system. So again, this is going to break the nervous system by doing this. For me, that takes a very, very... Uh oh I'm going to get this. I got it. That takes a very complex thing. And just that uses that big word as the end. So it's when I'm a smart person, I'm trying to make you feel dumb. I just say, well, all this and blah, 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 function. And if you don't do this, dysfunction will be created because the nervous system. And you're saying, because the nervous system... <laughs> which is way more complex than any of us meatheads can talk about. And we're using that as the end, which really where our knowledge base ends, but we're using it to say, don't ask any more questions because you're like, oh, fuck, nervous system. I don't know shit about that. Um, so again, the, the jump is, it seems to me to be a jump that I don't understand where this goes from observation to rule. And I don't know really where to draw the lines on that. I'm going to give you, again, at the end of this, make your own damn decision. I'll tell you what I do in the gym, and then you can figure it out on your own from there. Um, but the thing with all this is if this is going to be something, um, again, that is a rule, then it should be consistent throughout the body. So let's take these principles and let's put it somewhere else. If you look up this term, not as popular for some reason, I don't know why, but you have the pelvic femoral rhythm, which talks about basically, this is an interesting one too, because even if you look at the way that people talk about this, they don't actually talk about the other joints involved. <laughs> they just talk about your pelvis as if it just magically floats in space like a joint that just rotates. And they kind of neglect the other joints that are actually moving, that are allowing you to rotate when you're doing something like lying down or standing or whatever it is. But we have the pelvis here. So again, horrible drawing. This is the pelvis. And again, this is your femur sitting in your pelvis. So the observation we're going to talk about, I'm going to compare apples to apples. So we're going to talk about shoulder flexion, but the inverse can be true in extension. So again, while ranges are pretty well established, I don't know if this is because it is in this research. This is kind of the middle of ranges, but you find examples in extremes and studies where people's total hip flexion. Again, we're going to call it hip flexion. We're going to say, we're going to move this bone in space. We're going to, if I'm standing, we're going to move this bone up. You can't see, but that's me raising my knee. We're going to call that hip flexion. But the reality is it's not isolated, just femur and pelvis. The same way this just is an isolated humerus in the side of the scapula. So we're going to take a look at this. We're going to call it, I think instead of looking at what happens when we shoulder flex, what happens when we move our arm bone from our side to here. And so for this one, what happens when we move our femur from down to pulling it up as high as we can? What happens? So again, with my horrible drawing, this is supposed to be a pelvis. I was going to make this whole thing really pretty. I had thought about doing this video for a while because I've had so many questions on it. And I just like, here's how I want to do it. And then you guys know me. I'm just not going to have any production value. So here we are drawn on the board. It is what it is. Hopefully this helps. Someone else is going to think this is horrible. But what we have here is our pelvis. Um, is This is the starting position if we're going to do this hip flex flexion -y thingy. And this is the end position. So the exact same things that happen over here. Basically, something to a degree happens over here. Now, again, the ranges of this bone movie thing, sometimes observationally, is only 40 degrees. I'm sure the way there's extremes over here. But this is kind of middle of the road. So if someone can take it from the femur straight down, again, if you were lying, if you were lying down, you could imagine all this is lying on a bed, or if someone's standing and you raise it up, 
let's say this the bone travels 115 degrees kind of middle of the road is 25 of it comes from this pelvic rotation type thing now the funny thing is <laughs> pelvic just don't so what's the two joints here because i'm still don't talk about any joints there's this thing called your spine up here <laughs> so again they don't they don't talk about this so here's your spine straight and so then it is, if we move it to this way your spine is going to flex so to move from one position to the other your spine has to flex. So that's the other joint involved in here as well too. Technically multiple joints, those vertebrae, vertebra, each one is a joint. So basically this pelvic rotation that comes, so when we raise our knee up, basically we'll say in this 90 degrees of it comes from the actual femur moving in the pelvis. The other 25 degrees of it or so comes from this uh, rotation of the pelvis, which really comes from the rotation of the pelvis comes from spinal flexion. And so the funny thing about this is this is observed the same way this is observed taking some baseline movement so that's the thing with this too the baseline function is we're just going to look at something that happens people should be able to raise their arm that's a good thing right that's a functional movement that's just something people do and we're saying that's the way your body should properly function this is the exact same thing you look at any motion if you literally ask just someone raise your leg up as high as you can lie on a bench raise up as high as you can that's natural function you can observe this anytime observe it in sport when someone kicks, when someone does a high knee, when somebody does martial arts, whatever it is, these two joints always move together. Let's take the opposite of that as well too. So again, we didn't discuss the inverse here because of the nature of the joint, it's not as interesting, but what's the opposite here? What happens when you extend the hip? Whenever you extend the hip, meaning in this case, move your, your, move your femur bone from here to here, really it doesn't come at just one joint in any natural functional movement. Again, baseline here, this is natural, this is functional. What's natural functional extending your leg back. Anytime you extend your leg, the natural functional thing of how your body is supposed to move is your spine extends. And if you're not aware of that, look at what it looks like when someone walks, when someone jumps, when someone sprints, there is never a time when you're going to have hip extension in isolation. It always comes with lumbar spinal extension. So if that's not interesting to anyone, it's interesting to me. <laughs> Because all of these things, is that's all observational, that's all observational. I think both of these observations are interesting, and this is for sure how your body moves. If I just said some random person off the, off the street and said, hey, let's observe how the body is supposed to function. Take an athlete, because athletes are how we're supposed to move. The most athletic person you know, oh, that's look how good that moves. That's the way it's supposed to move. Look how good this moves. But the thing is, if this is a principle, and you're going to make all of these claims of this, it better be consistent throughout the rest of the body, right? Because again, these things don't happen in isolation. But a lot of people <laughs> preach the opposite of this, right? So think about what people uh, preach whenever you're doing hip extension type movements. It is blasphemy if you extend your spine, right? Because if you extend your spine, your spinal extensions are going to work too much. I don't know based on too much for anybody. Um, and in fact, the opposite happens. <laughs> Most people will coach the opposite thing, right? So for a lot of hip extension type movements, especially bridge type things, they will actually coach a posterior pelvic tilt, which is hip extension and spinal flexion. That is the opposite of pelvic humoral rhythm. Oh, fuck! Does anyone else think that's crazy? Like, because if you do this, if you don't follow these rules, your shoulder joint's gonna explode. And that's just not following the general rule. This one does the opposite. You do the opposite, what's gonna happen? I think your femur's just gonna fall right off of your damn pelvis. Your glutes are gonna rip off your body. And you're, you're not going to remember how to walk, how to jump. You're going to have so much dysfunction just from, I don't know how many times it, cur it takes. Is it one rep? Is it two reps? Is it 10 reps to have dysfunction from extending your hip and flexing your spine at the same time? Hmm, interesting. So when you're looking at this observation that for some people has turned into a scary rule, make sure you take all these principles. And this isn't obviously, this is just one interesting one. I mean, you can look at what happens in your lower leg when you walk, look at your upper body when you're doing a whole bunch of other motions, look at happens when your spine when you're doing stuff. Things in your body, the way things function, the patterns, the movements, they never happen in isolation. And so again, there are some groups of people, again, if you're getting into more of the functional realm of training a different thing outside the bodybuilding, they kind of believe this is the best way to train and move things. But for the most part, they're consistent, right? So they have consistent, some, not all of them, there's a lot of crazy shit there as well too, but there's some consistent principles. This whole notion of not training in isolation, everything's big movements, big patterns, big whatever. Um, so if that's you, then you're gonna basically adhere to these rules on both of these things. But within the bodybuilding world, everything's isolation. Everything, right? We do tons of isolation. Nothing happens in this functional realm, except apparently for the shoulder joint. Like I said, we train hip extension by itself. 
We train hip extension, keeping the spine still. We train hip extension, flexing the spine. Still blows my mind. Our nervous system is just going to blow up. Uh, we train knee extension and knee flexion in isolation. We've trained dorsal and plantar flexion in isolation. And again, those things never happen. The proper function, the proper patterns of how your body is supposed to work, that never occurs. So what does all this mean? In case you haven't caught on, I personally don't think there's anything wrong at all with training hip extension and maybe a little bit of spinal extension. Even worse for how your body's supposed to function, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with training hip extension and spinal flexion. So even though I said that, kind of making a point here, the jokey joke, I think it's fine. I think pretty much any joint in the body can train in isolation. I would make a huge argument, especially for the hypertrophy world, it should train in isolation if you're looking for maximum stimulus. But also in the corrective world, if you look at some of the best corrective people in the world, in my opinion, if you look at the functional anatomy seminars group people, you look at the MAT group people, you look at some of the concepts you're going to get from RTS people, is if you actually want to fix stuff, you need to work in isolation. Because if you have one piece broken and you try and address the chain, you might just make a whole bunch of different compensations within that train and not address the one piece that's broken. So I actually think it's a very functional thing to work in isolation at times. And then again, at some point in time, like how does your body remember how to do things? I mean, you, you have a complex pattern of walking and jumping, whatever. As long as you do that activity, that's the notion of like sports-specific training. That's where some of that stuff comes from, that if I play football, the only exercise that I can do if I'm a quarterback is to grab a cable and, and do this motion with a cable, which is idiotic. If I just do something, if I'm a football player and I increase my overall body strength and my overall body size, most of the time is beneficial for almost every sport, and I just go and do this by itself at some other time throughout the day, your body's not going to forget. In my opinion, one rep certainly doesn't do it. 10 reps doesn't do it. 100 reps doesn't break patterns or change things in the body. It's just how your body works. You can isolate things. You can move things together. And I don't think your nervous system or whatever the fuck does all that, your brain is so sensitive, that one rep or 10 reps or 100 reps within a workout are going to break something. Where again, as soon as you're done with your calf workout, you're done off a hard bunch of sets on the leg extension. Again, aside from actually falling over because it's funny because you're dead and your quads are broke, I've never seen anyone actually forget how to walk after that. So all that being said, my point is just to kind of disarm some of this. I think there's fear created around this. Um, so just don't freak out. And again, when somebody tells you something like that, I'm just presenting all that shit. Then I did give my opinion at the end where I think it's okay to work in isolation. That's based off of smarter people than me that seem to think it's a good idea to work in isolation at times. Um, but then also, well, what do we do with this? Is there something to be gained from here? Sure, there's something to be gained from there. So let's look in the gym. And again, if we're going to move 180 degrees, can there be problems from trying to make up all this motion from a joint that doesn't have that much motion? Probably. Where do you draw the line? I don't know. Okay, so where this gets talked about is overhead pressing a lot. In my opinion, depending on the overhead press, it probably makes a difference. So let's just say you're doing some little shitty range of motion press. Is this a good position, bad position, whatever, you're comfortable here. And you're pressing through this, 40 degrees range of motion. Does your scapula have to move when you're going through 40 degrees range of motion? Well, that GH joint has 120 degrees range of motion. What the hell is going to be a problem with just moving through 40? I think you could train a joint in isolation. I think it's perfectly fine. Now let's say you're doing a, uh, maybe a Swiss bar press or a dumbbell press where you're bringing it down the side and you're bringing it straight overhead. Look at how much range of motion that is. That is near 180 degrees. Depending on where you stop, 160 degrees is reasonable. Well, we know your GH joint sure as hell doesn't have 160 degrees. Most people, somebody's probably does somewhere. So in that case, it's probably a good idea to let your shoulder blade move and not intentionally crank it back down. So the same thing for chest. People talk about chest a lot. If someone's doing a pressy type motion, you see from above, and this is my pressy type motion, and that upper arm is moving through 40 degrees, maybe a bench pressy type thing, it, can I move it through 40 degrees? Again, I know that's abduction, adduction, but that joint has a lot of range of motion. It's got 120 here. I don't know how much it has by itself here, but probably similar amount, 120. Do I have to move my scapula even if I'm only moving it through a short range? I don't know. Now let's say I'm doing a fly. So I can really crank this fly back here. Can't quite see that from the top. And I can crank it all the way across and fully shorten that pec. That could easily be, I don't know, make a number up, 130, 140 degrees range of motion. So you're doing a fly. Well, we sure as hell know that GH joint doesn't have 120 degrees range of motion. So if we're trying to move that upper arm, that bone in space from start to finish through 140, yes, your scapula is probably going to move. So my take on this, which I'm not going to draw a line in the sand, you're just going to have to use your brain a little bit. If you have something where your upper arm bone 
is moving through a lot of range of motion, well over what's in isolation, or even close to the ends, right? Because there is that notion. So again, let's say I try and keep it completely still. I move it through exactly 120 degrees. If I lock that scapula in stone, when I get to the end of that, could I maybe smush it? Maybe. I can't prove it. But I think it makes sense that you could smush stuff. So maybe. So basically, the more range of motion your upper arm bone moves through, probably the more your shoulder blade should move. The less it moves through, I personally don't think it's imperative. Again, that's my educated guess. Um, so what does this look like in training? Well, lots of times when I'm coaching people doing things, now again, there's, there's training tools in here as well too. So I've had people where when they're pressing, it's just like this. It's just pure, the GH joint's not moving a whole lot and it's just a lot of scapular motion. So there may be a time and place to have someone learn how to keep everything completely still just so they can feel how pec influences a joint without too many other joints moving. That being said, the way that I like to coach all of this is you have this rigidity and tightness that you're creating. Rigidity, tightness, bracing, um, security, whatever words you want to use, stability, doesn't mean static, doesn't mean things have to hold still. So if I have somebody pressing, I want them, one, to learn how to control their shoulder blades first. So just to be able to put them wherever they want, whenever they want, and learn how to train their pecs. Once someone learns how to train their pecs properly, I have them keep their shoulder blades tight, <laughs> And then I just have them contract their pecs as hard as they can and just let what happens happen. So if you watch any video of myself or Terrence training, it's very easy to see when he's doing a pressing movement, like a converging chest press that moves through maybe 100 degrees range of motion, his scapula clearly moves. You can see if you just envision the dot on his GH joint, it's going and then it just kind of wraps around a little bit. When we do flies, you can clearly see it moving. I don't even have to coach him on that. I just say, all right, he's in good positions. Okay, and the thing that I do coach, I think it makes sense at the bottom from a muscle length thing, from basically a not wanting to use the delta as much thing. At the bottom, I think it makes a lot of sense. I will cue people to feel like they're rowing. So pull that bar into you, row with your shoulder blades pulling back and together, and that should be your position in the bottom. Once you have that in the bottom, your shoulder blades, your scapula are tight, there's rigidity there, just contract your pecs and things go where they go. If you stay within the shortest range of motion, they might not move. I personally think that's fine. As the range of motion expands and you contract your pecs hard as hell, they might move. They might pull around. Same thing for shoulders. If I have someone working here, just keep things tight. Contract your front delt as hard as you possibly can. The scap's going to go where it goes. If you do this, it might not move. If you do this, it's probably going to move and you don't have to coach it too much. So hopefully all of that long ranting gave you, I'm attempting to, not going to happen though, attempting to keep this relatively unbiased definition of what this is, what I have heard to be some of the claims when we've basically moved from observation to some sort of rule type thing. And I did this one comparison because we have a cool name for that as well too. You can Google that if you want. Um, again, not studied as much. So these terms are just kind of whatever. But taking this principle, can we apply this principle elsewhere in the body and does it hold true? for whoever is saying it. So again, depends on the population. If it can hold true from joint to joint, from body to body, of a principle of how things should function, then have at it. And again, that's some people do that. Some groups do that. Some people only train things function, only ground-based. If your feet are off the ground, it's not how your body works. We can't do that type deal. Um, but again, if depending on the context of where this is in the bodybuilding world, again, I personally train things in isolation all the time. I'm gonna go train some stuff in isolation in just a little bit. There's gonna be some leg curls, some calf raises, some leg extensions. Then I'll tie it all together functionally in a hack. A hack certainly isn't functional. I'll push a prowler to finish though. That is functional. Push and shit has got to be the first functional leg movement ever made. So anyway, hopefully give you a complete picture of both of these. Just something to get your gears turning a little bit maybe. To actually say, anytime you hear a principle, same for me. I try and make my stuff principle-based training. And sometimes I do shit because I like it or I've seen it produce results. And that's my reason. That's my principle sometimes. I'll normally always say, hey, I did this because I like it. I did this because it produces results. Or here's these principles that are the same from my triceps to my biceps to my quads, you know, from how I feel joint function works in the body. And I want to have consistency from things to things. But really, I want you to take all this information. And again, I'm giving you a little bit of practical information at the end is just to just say, hey, here's how I train chest. Here's how I train shoulders. I don't know if it's right. Same as all this shit. It's an educated guess of the best things to do. So take all that information. Use your brain. Make some decisions for yourself. And uh, as always, if you stuck through this whole damn thing, kudos to you, hypertrophy hug. Um, leave some comments, feedback below. Let me know if you want more stuff like this. Again, I tend to not do this because I like to make things just right and perfect and it never happens. So I end up just drawing on the board. So if you want some more board stuff, 